When you're a kid, you assume your parents are soulmates. My kids are going to be right about that. Romeo and Juliet. My only love sprung from my only hate. Rick and Ilsa. Here's looking at you, kid. Elizabeth and Darcy. My feelings will not be repressed. Jim and Pam. And when it happens, it's going to kick your ass, Beasley. Are these two office sweethearts the great love story of our times? He said that you told him how much you love me. About how you feel when I walk in a room. Ever since The Office began airing, viewers were swept away by the quiet, slow-burning romance of Jim Halpert and Pamela Beasley, the update to the British office's Tim and Dawn. I call it Pam Pong. I count how many times Jim gets up from his desk and goes to reception to talk to you. What's groundbreaking about the Jim and Pam phenomenon is that it turned our preconceptions of The Office romance upside down, and they made companionship aspirational. We wanted to stay on the phone all day, but the company has a policy against eight-hour personal calls. So let's look at why Jim and Pam are a landmark couple in TV history and how they reshape the office romance on screen. You know what I want to do today? I want to marry you. Before we go on, we want to talk a little about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is a superb online learning community with thousands of classes about everything. Vlogging, cinematography, even painting with watercolors. Click the link in the description below to get two months access to all classes for free. Jim and Pam set a new bar for couple goals. They established an ideal of companionship. If I left, what would I do with all this useless information in my head? You know, tonnage price of manila folders, um, Pam's favorite flavor of yogurt, which is mixed berry. This is a portrait of two people who prove how fun it can be to spend all your time together when you're deeply in sync. All her idea, too. Awesome. She is so great. Here's a short list of what's amazing about Jim and Pam as companions. Number one, they have fun together. Hey, is this Dwight? Yes, it is. Oh my goodness, you sound sexy. Oh, thank you. I've been working out. Whoa, 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 Pam, you. Pam, you are not talking to Dwight right now. You are talking to Jim. They're always playing games, planning pranks, making each other laugh. The key to being a strong couple is simply enjoying your present together. And making fun a priority is the best way to remember that you like each other. Number two, they're so good at catching each other's nonverbal cues that it feels like they read each other's minds. Take the episode when The Office plans to throw an ironic party to express their dislike of Nellie. After Jim finds out Nellie got her heart broken by a magician, he tells Pam to call off the prank, but doesn't have time to explain why. Call it off, Pam. Call it off, okay? It's way more complicated than you think. Cancel the magician. Trust me. So she takes his word for it and tries to stop the plan. When the co-workers create the code to criticize Nellie through the code name Pam, we hate Pam! Every day, I imagine how happy I'd be if Pam died. <laughs> oh. Jim quickly gets what's happening through Pam's nonverbal signals. He starts trolling the magician to make Nellie feel better. Do not say what it is. It's four hearts. So Pam immediately picks up on what Jim's doing and steps in to help him push the magician over the edge. That's not a real knot. When you pull on it, it disappears. What the hell? Crucially, they don't even have to explain. They just trust. Trust me. Okay. Trust me. Oh, okay. Like a two-person improv team, always saying yes to their partner's suggestion. Number three, they find thoughtful, creative ways to express love. Their gifts aren't about spending money, but about finding or making something personal that draws on their shared memories and what they know about each other. Um, what else? Ooh, this is a hot sauce packet. She put this on a hot dog a couple years ago because she thought it was ketchup. <laughs> and uh, it was really funny. Number four, they're gentle with each other. Fail. There's an underlying patience and generosity of spirit between them. Hey, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? If anyone can do this, you can do this. You can do this. Number five, they have shared values. Both are caring and compassionate, and they notice when others are upset and try to help. Pretty they're reasonable and fair, and they're always grounded enough to laugh at the ridiculousness around them. 
You could sum up all these aspirational aspects of their relationship in one word, friendship. Jim and Pam prove that the idea of being best friends with your partner really is the most romantic thing in the world. I mean, that's just pretty killer, right? Maybe it's the office, you know? Maybe you're destined to fall in love with whoever you share the office with. That's ridiculous. <laughs> if love worked that way, there'd be office romances all over the place. <laughs> Businessmen having affairs with their secretaries, please! Let's review how office romances have traditionally been depicted on screen. I think it could happen right there on that desk. They tend to be steamy, full of passion and heat. Maybe even a love-hate dynamic. I hate you with the white-hot intensity of a thousand suns. Somebody's cranky. <laughs> the quintessential example from the 80s was Moonlighting, which hooked millions of viewers with Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepard as co-workers who couldn't stand or resist each other. You know it and I know it. You feel it and I feel it. And this tradition has continued since. I don't think about you at all anymore. I don't think about you either. I never think about you when I'm home alone in bed under the covers warm at night. I don't think about you when I'm in a hot tub with high-powered jets. Office romances are often forbidden or against the rules. You know it's against the rules. Which adds to the steaminess. They might be between co-workers in high-intensity jobs, where the attraction comes out of their irregular routines, their shared passion for what they do, and the feeling that others can't understand what drives them. I know you, Hildy. I know what quitting would mean to you. Well, what would it mean? It would kill you. <laughs> you can't sell me that, Walter Burns. Who says I can't? You're a newspaper man. Then there are the stories that prove the common wisdom of office romances generally being a bad idea. These impulsive flings prove to be mistakes, end badly, and leave an awkward, painful fallout. But if staying here means working within 10 yards of you, frankly, I'd rather have a job wiping Saddam Hussein's ass. And finally, you have the boss and secretary, or boss and employee romance. These stories explore the dynamic between two people on different levels of the hierarchy. Here's a hundred dollars, you go and buy yourself something. Huh? And the power imbalance adds tension or contributes to the sense that it's wrong. I've probably taken advantage of your kindness on too many occasions. Excuse me? If we put these tropes together, a certain portrait emerges, a semi-antagonistic, forbidden but irresistible heat, born of a fast-paced, high-stakes job. All this is the antithesis of Jim's and Pam's office romance. So as the opposite of all these hot, thrilling office romance tropes, Jim and Pam established a new kind of office romance on screen. The sweet, slow-burning, shy love grounded in a boring, normal workplace, just like most of ours. So which one is Jim? Mom. <laughs> I just wanted to know. Even Jim's and Pam's big romantic grand gestures are modest and understated. That must have been a surprise when at the gas station you proposed. No, it was really, it was really sweet. It was raining and... Oh, yeah, you didn't say that the weather was bad. That sounds perfect. The magic of Jim and Pam is that they turned normal life into the stuff of a great love story. And they reveal why a connection based on actually liking each other is superior to the flimsy, ignitable spark of Orion and Kelly, who are essentially the office's cartoon version of that traditional moonlighting dynamic. You lied about being pregnant. Right, so? You really don't understand why that might make me kind of angry. No. We're never getting back together. Why not? Ultimately, Jim's and Pam's love is the great office romance of our times because it is equal parts office and romance. It is very much grounded in what a workday in an office is really like, unglamorous and unsexy most of the time. It captures the small yet powerful joys that come in those breaks from productivity, those shared jokes, those little games that miraculously emerge between tasks. I intercepted a transmission earlier, and it seems that the CIA is going to need to wipe down in their headquarters at Langley for training and an ice cream social with the other agents. One of the things that makes The Office such an addictive watch is that, underlying the comedy of each episode, the show is a soap opera. And part of why we're so invested in this relationship is structural. Jim and Pam anchor the plotline for so many seasons. 
A number of seasons begin and end with their dramatic relationship moments. Jim, I called off my wedding because of you. So season two begins with Pam drunkenly kissing Jim and ends with Jim telling Pam, I'm in love with you. Season three begins with Jim transferring branches and Pam calling off her engagement and ends with him breaking up with Karen to ask Pam out. Are you free for dinner tonight? Yes. All right, then it's a date. Season five starts with their engagement and ends with the discovery that Pam is pregnant. It's not just Jim and Pam who provide the soap operatic momentum in the show. We also have Angela and Dwight, and then Angela and Dwight's love triangle with Andy, Andy's love triangle with Aaron and Gabe, Michael's on and off love with Holly, and yet another Andy love triangle with Aaron and Pete. Love triangle, drama. That's not even counting couples like Ryan and Kelly who are played for comedy. We belong, we belong, we belong together, Ryan. Interestingly, if you look at the other relationships in the show, the ones that mirror Jim and Pam are the ones that work, while the ones that fit the conventional office romance tropes fizzle or flame out. Michael and Holly are another great successful love because they, like Jim and Pam, have fun together. Michael is actually killing it with Holly. And I think I know why. It's because Holly is kind of a major dork. And they understand each other to the point that they basically have their own language. Holly Flack, marrying me will you be? Your wife be coming, me will I? Frank and Bean. <laughs> Always makes her laugh. Frank and Bean. <laughs> Angela and Dwight may have more of an animal heat, but like Jim and Pam, they have a shared outlook. You're not stupid. Jazz is stupid. <laughs> Jazz is stupid! I mean, just play the right notes! Enduring loyalty and deep mutual understanding, even their own language. What about that meeting later to discuss finances? Yes, but don't expect anything. What if I'm hungry? No cooking. And they have to overcome deep personal fears in order to be together. Angela's not really a risk taker, and Andy's not really a risk. By the end, the show marks Aaron and Pete as the new Jim and Pam. The co-workers call Pete the new Jim. They're like the new Jim and Dwight. While Aaron takes over Pam's seat at reception, and like younger Pam, takes a long time to break up with a boyfriend who doesn't appreciate her. I was worried that you were dead. You were gone for three months. Even as she's clearly falling in love with her best friend at the office. Pete and I work well together. Not that there's anything special about Pete. It could be any guy or girl, not that I'm into girls. Not that I'm into Pete. Aaron and Pete are one of the sweetest couples to watch in the whole series because, like Jim and Pam, they have that adorable gentleness and generosity towards each other. I just want you to be happy, okay? Andy, on the other hand, can never get his relationships to work because, unlike mind-reading wizards Jim and Pam, he doesn't try hard enough to get inside his partner's mind and put what they're feeling first. I know you may not be feeling love for me right now, but if you fake it, I won't be able to tell the difference. He's too hung up on his self-involved concerns or adolescent ideas of how he thinks he should act in a relationship. You're making it too easy for her. You're just conveying, oh, I like you just the way you are. But I do like her just the way she is. Well, that's not what we agreed on. And as we've seen, Kelly and Ryan are the joke version of the typical office romance, the anti-Jim and Pam, which means they're off as much as they're on. It's weird, I'd rather she be alone than with somebody. Is that love? Throughout all of this, you almost don't notice that this show is a soap opera because Beginning with Jim and Pam, the show mastered the realistic, relatable office romance. You came up to my desk and you said, this might sound weird, mm -hmm. and there's no reason for me to know this, but that mixed berry yogurt you're about to eat has expired. That was the moment that you knew you liked me. Yep. 
All along, the aspirational aspect of Jim's and Pam's relationship is balanced by its down-to-earth realism. Jim is handsome, but he's goofy enough to feel like a guy who works at a paper company. And Pam as the girl next door, or girl next desk, while obviously beautiful, is dressed to look unfashionable. Pam. Those make you look so ugly. They're irregular, even increasingly frumpy over time. Well, 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 it's finally happened. Pam has ceased caring. And on a deeper level, The Office's love stories tap into the way romantic drama feels in our lives. How interminable and dramatic it can be to have a crush on someone at work and not say anything for months, even years. Jim was five feet from my desk and it took me four years to get to him. How, in your life, it probably doesn't erupt into this explosive Hollywood sex scene, but is experienced in tiny, scrutinized, awkwardly lit moments. So I got her a Valentine's Day card, but I didn't want to seem too eager, so I got cards for everyone in the whole office to kind of dilute it a little bit. Another thing that makes Jim and Pam real as a couple is that they're not a perfect couple. I'm afraid you're gonna resent me, and I'm afraid that resent this is not you. enough for you, and I'm afraid that I'm not enough for you. Pam represses her feelings for Jim for years because she's engaged to Roy. And it's hardly like he's some kind of catch making this a reasonably difficult decision for a girl. Man, I would be all over that if I wasn't dating Pam. We're not dating, we're engaged. It feels to us this choice between Roy and Jim should be very easy, but for a long time, Pam doesn't see that. And this itself is all too relatable. Even looking back on our own life choices, the right answers look obvious. But in the moment, we often act in cautious, risk-averse, self-sabotaging ways. But when the documentary started airing, people on the street told me that I had this fairy tale romance. There were a lot of times last year when it did not feel like a fairy tale. When we start to see Jim's and Pam's relationship problems center stage, we can actually see the seeds of these issues early on. They're the flip sides to the couple's strengths, as is generally the case in relationships. I need to look like a team player, Pam. So you invested $10,000 to look like a team player? And as we've seen, they rarely fight. But this means they don't know how to fight or even communicate about difficult topics. Come on, there's gotta be something. Between your birth and the last two days, something you just haven't had the chance to tell me. Uh... They hold back. Early on, their non-confrontational nature keeps them from facing their feelings. It needed to be said, and I said it. And it only took me three years to summon the courage, so... And as time goes on, they continue to keep secrets from each other, withhold important information, or make significant decisions without consulting each other. He took this job in Philly without telling me. He bought our house without telling me. At a certain point, he shouldn't be rewarded for that. As we saw, another strength of Jim's and Pam's relationship is their mind-reader-like intimacy. Yet, this strength is another source of their problems. Their life is so safe and solid, Jim freaks out that he has no big challenges to look forward to. With work and two kids, there's nothing interesting is gonna happen to us for a long, long time. At this stage in life, there's a mismatch in what they want. He wants challenge and excitement. There's always something better. She's happy with safe and boring. Dwight, you may find this hard to believe, but I love my boring life. Come on. Exactly the way it is. No. But Jim doesn't know how to address this with Pam, so he says one thing to her face and acts differently behind her back. I still can't believe he didn't tell me. The couple's willingness to sacrifice for each other is another strength. But Pam has a habit of accepting things the way they are, instead of pushing for better. I really didn't like it. It's just designing logos and stuff, and I miss Scranton. So because Jim has made Pam his first priority, he ends up indulging her inertia and staying stuck in this life when a part of him that he's ignoring wants a bigger challenge. I mean, if she left, I wouldn't blow my brains out. Of course, I would take that job in Maryland. So the last chapter of their love story is about the couple facing and addressing their relationship's shortcomings and remembering why and how much they still love each other. Not enough for me. You are. Season 9 can be hard to watch for Jim and Pam fans, but it's important to see them struggle and, in the process, prove key relationship truths. 
all strengths bring with them equal and opposite weaknesses in a partnership. That any relationship requires work and the choice to stick it out. I think that you should stay and I think we should fight. And that, in the end, love is stronger for the tests it survives. But then it got deeper and it got stronger and now it's better than a fairy tale. It's like a long book that you never want to end. In many TV series, those volcanic, red-hot romances tend to peter out once the couple gets together, or else the writers hook audiences by keeping the couple apart. But after Jim and Pam get together... Oh, we're dating. Wow. There it is. The Office still devotes a lot of time to the milestones of their committed partnership. Getting engaged, moving in, buying a house, pregnancies, becoming parents, dealing with hard times. Their relationship plays out over nine seasons in a way that's rare on screen. And so this TV romance is special for both its stability and its completeness. Oh, yeah, pregnant. Right here, little Michael Scott. Nope, I told you I don't like that joke. Jim and Pam won hearts not because their romance was so unbelievable, but because we could believe it, because it felt like part of our lives. They showed us that true intimacy and partnership can turn even the most unremarkable of places into some kind of wonderful. Got it a week after we started dating. This is Mari Andrew. Mari is an illustrator and writer who built a huge Instagram following by expressing herself authentically, and then channeled that into becoming a New York Times best-selling author. And Mari teaches a class on drawing as self-discovery on Skillshare. I'll give you some prompts and self-reflection exercises and some ideas, and at the end you'll have a beautiful collection of art that's meaningful to you. This is why we love Skillshare service. The classes are taught by amazing, accomplished working professionals in design, photography, social media, business, entrepreneurship, and more. In fact, Skillshare has actually helped us at Screen Prism learn more about animation and design. They offer 20,000 classes about any skill you might want to learn, all for less than $10 a month. Right now, you can get two months access to all their classes for free, but that's only if you're one of the first 500 people to click the link in our description below. It's a great deal, so hurry up and don't miss out.